All right, hi everybody. Uh, thank you to the organizers, which I guess is me, um, for having me uh, to speak. Um, I was I was curious when I was putting the talk together. I was like, why am I the one talking about noise sources? Ugh. And as I was going through the data characteristics handbook for Kepler written by Christensen et al. 2012, taking all the figures out for this talk, I was like, that's why they made me talk about this. Uh, so I didn't want this just to be a laundry list of every single thing that stands between you and a clean planet signal. So I hope it's not, but let's go through the narrative that I came up with. Why do we care about noise? Why, does it, why can't we just have all these fancy statistical methods and get the answer? Uh, why do we care about noise? So like Jason, a lot of what I'm gonna say comes from a Kepler point of view. They asked two Kepler people to speak in a row, so you're getting a bit of an overload. Um, but let's talk about Kepler. The primary goal of Kepler was to determine the occurrence rate of Earth-like planets around Sun-like stars. And there's a certain math that you need to think about when you go into that, uh, because Earths are tiny and suns are huge. Uh, so a transit of an Earth-like planet is only 85 parts per million. Uh, so you need to work out how much noise you can have in your survey in order that you could find Earth-like planets uh, with a minimum of three transits, for instance, uh, around a reasonable number of stars because you want to do statistics. So the error budget that Kepler came up with was 20 parts per million in six hours on a 12th magnitude star. Uh, and that broke down into three different sources of noise. This is laser pointer. Ha! Noise from stars, shot noise from various sources, uh, which I'll talk more about, and noise from the detector. Uh, and if you take the quadratic, if you sum of these in quadrature, you get 20 parts per million. So that was the budget. Because the thing is, you're trying to get an 85 parts per million transit signal. So, you know, a 20 parts per million noise gives you like three or four sigma per transit, and then you get three transits, you sum them up, and you aim for this seven sigma, this magic number that Jason was talking about. You need to hit seven sigma in order to have the, the false positive rate that you expect. Now, in order to hit this noise level, you have to make a bunch of decisions about how you're gonna design Kepler so that you get here. And this is where you really care about your noise sources. You need to understand how much each of these different sources is contributing to this final error budget of 20 parts per million. And then you have to, you basically design around that. You say, okay, how many photons do we need to get from the star? Uh, how long, how many stars do we need to look at? Uh, what kinds of stars can we look at? How faint can the stars be that we look at? Uh, all of these decisions are made around the noise budget. This is why we care about noise. Finally, you know, in terms of budget, how much do we need to spend to make this happen? Um, I wanted to introduce this figure now because it's going to come up a few times during the talk. I'll just keep talking into the microphone while these guys sort out my wardrobe malfunction. Okay. So this is the magnitude of the stars. We have faint stars here, <laughs> bright stars here, and faint stars here. And this is the noise. Just pull it out. <laughs> Thank you. All right, let's get back to it. Um, let's try that. How's that? Is that okay? Can everyone hear me? It should stay still now. All right. Uh, this is the noise measured in six hours. Uh, uh, so that's summing up all of the case, all of the observations taken in that six-hour period. Um, and basically, you can see that for bright stars, we have lower noise, and for faint stars, we have higher noise. And I'm going to go into more details about the co contributions to this plot, but I just wanted to situate it on it now. OK, so I stole this slide from Dan Foreman Mackey, whose name you already heard, uh, from a few weeks ago in Davos, because I thought it was a really nice breakdown of the different things. Because you know, having done a lot of transit surveys at this point, I've seen this a lot of times. So what this is, is this is your planet signal. Uh, this is your star introducing all of the things that stars do into the problem. This is the spacecraft introducing all of the things that spacecraft do, and I'm going to go through these individually. Uh, now, Dan and myself and Jason have to check our spacecraft privilege at the door, because not everybody gets to use Kepler, almost, or DWST. Really, this needs to break down. Telescopes do stuff, and atmospheres do stuff. Have to break this in a bit. And then detectors do stuff. So I think of it like you have this nice, clean planet signal, and to be fair, these days, planets do stuff too. This nice, clean planet signal, do you guys remer remember American Gladiator? I don't know if you're young enough or too international, but there was this show where this like, puny little competitor had to run this gauntlet, and these like, big muscled people, and, doof, 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 and you know, maybe the battered, poor, puny person makes it through at the end, yes. 
Uh, so we're going to run through the gauntlet today and meet all of our gladiators. Okay, stars do stuff. Part one. They emit photons. Uh, this sounds trivial, but the, but the contribution to the discussion here is the way is so stars emit photons at a finite rate, we observe them. So we observe a Poisson distribution of photons from these stars, which means there's an uncertainty, just straight up associated with the fact that, that you get a certain number of photons out of the star, uh, which is defined by basically the square root of the number of photons. Um, and this introduces a noise flaw, essentially. I mean, you can integrate for longer and longer, but you need to make this trade between well sampling your transit, your transit is a finite length, you can't integrate forever, uh, and getting as many photons as possible. Um, so this basically sets this noise floor here. Uh, it's one of the contributors to this noise floor. Um, is just basically the shot noise from the star, the, the, the photon noise from the star. And you might be thinking, well, if it's the square root of the number of photons, why does it get bigger as the star gets fainter? Because there are fewer photons, so the square root is smaller. The fractional number of photons that is taken up by this uncertainty gets bigger as you go to smaller and smaller stars. So that's why you see this ramp here. But you can see that actually, if these are Kepler's stars, we didn't actually make it here. We didn't make it down to that line. Why didn't we make it down to that line? Stars do other stuff as well, among other things. We saw this slide this morning. I'm sorry that I couldn't be here for Xavier's talk, so hopefully I don't repeat too much of what he said. But some of these are relevant for transits as well. Um, mostly this section is what we'll talk about, because those are the time scales that are affecting transits. All right. So. Oscillations, uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail because I really hope Xavier talked about most of this this morning. Um, so uh, stars uh, have, uh, basically the way, the way I like to think about it is they ring like a bell. So they have unstable convective outer layers, sound waves travel through them, and there's basically they set up resonances. And you see these oscillations. And you see them in the light curves of the stars. You don't just see them in the radial velocity, you see them in the light curves. Um, they're typically shorter time scale than transits. Uh, I'm, what I'm showing here, uh, this is a slide from Dan Huber, is uh, as stars get bigger, the, the size and the, and the period of these oscillations gets larger as well. But uh, down here, we really care about the sort of more main sequence stars with Kepler, and I'll talk about why that is, and in which case, they're quite small and usually less than 15 minutes. So that's shorter, reasonably shorter than the time scale of a transit, so maybe that's okay. Okay, granulation, um, you've already seen this, I think, a couple of times now. Um, but it doesn't just affect radial velocities. Uh, so this is again the, the uh, surface of the star is having these, you know, the hot plasma is coming up and the cool plasma is going down. When you integrate that over the entire surface of the star, admittedly it's a small effect. Uh, it's 0.1%. But remember, we're looking for something which is 0.01%. So this is actually a big deal. Um, and, and it's on longer time scales, but it's low. So we care about it. Um, so what else do we care about? Magnetic activity, okay. So spots is something that we care about. So this is the sun, this is our sun, and this is a transit of Mercury. Mercury's pretty small, admittedly, but what you can see in this reasonably inactive solar surface is some spots that are either the same size or bigger than Mercury. Um, the sun is rotating more slowly enough that the time scale of variability introduced by these spots on a light curve is, is reasonably well separated from a transit. But that's not always the case for all stars. Sometimes you have faster rotators and then suddenly, you know, interesting things are happening on transit time scales. And that's when you worry, when you can't separate them well in time. So here's an example of a light curve, random active Kepler star. Um, uh, this is three months worth of data. And you can see basically two spot complexes uh, and the thing with spots is they evolve as well. It's not just this constant thing that you can just fit out. Uh, it's this evolving thing. Uh, this is like one spot complex is getting bigger and the other one's getting smaller and stuff's happening. Stars do stuff. All right, stars also have flares. Um, so this is the surface of the star, has these big magnetic reconnections uh, and they, it lets out bursts of energy. These are more stochastic, so they're very hard to predict or model in advance. Um, they usually have well-characterized shapes though, so that's a bonus. Um, they're on the order of a few percent, so much larger than transits. So if you have a really, really flaring light curve, like for instance this one from Jim Davenport, uh, that's going to be tough for transits. So this one you see both. You see, star, you see uh, spots rotating, you see this rotational period of the star, and on top of that you see all of these flares. And the color here represents the number of people who looked at that light curve and identified that as a flare, which is why the big ones are red and the little ones are blue. Um, but if you tried to find a transit here, I mean, you're talking about like 
this much? It's hard. Um, all right, so stars don't just oscillate, they pulsate. This is a separate thing where it has to do with the opacity of the layers inside the star and balancing the, the radiation going outwards and the gravity pulling inwards. So this is like Delta Scudis and RLRs and Cepheids and, and Myras. So you have a large time scale of variation of pulsations, um, usually larger than you'd like. <laughs> um, so here's just an example of a pulsating light curve. And again, this is kind of on the time scale of transits and therefore in the way. Uh, just because I can't actually give a talk anymore without showing a light curve with an injected planet in it, apparently. Uh, here's one of my light curves out of Kepler. The red boxes here, this is three different sections of data from this light curve. The red boxes show where I injected the transit and how deep it is. You tell me whether you think you can see it. This is what pulsations do to your light curve, ladies and gentlemen. Ugh. All right. So that's a whole bunch of stuff that single stars do. If you have multiple stars, they start to interact with each other in, in frustrating ways. What I'm talking about here is the noise, that they, the signal that they introduce to light curves. Tim, tomorrow, is going to talk about false positives and telling eclipses apart from transits. That's not what I'm talking about here, just the fact that eclipses make it hard to find transits. So this is actually a page from my thesis. I went up to my office yesterday, and I took it off the shelf for the first time in a long time and found some light curves. I did a ground-based transit survey as a grad student, uh, so I looked at a lot of light curves in my time. Um, and this is just some example, like morphology of different types of things that stars do in light curves. Um, and so this is a contact binary where the two stars are so close that they're actually, you know, touching each other, essentially, their roche lobes have overflowed. Um, these are some detached eclipsing binaries down here. They just make it hard to find transit signals because there's so much going on. And here are some longer period variable stars, RLRAs and MIRAs down here. Lots of stuff, stuff happens. So, yikes, like I just listed a whole bunch of things that are much larger than the transits that we're looking for. Luckily, most of those are reasonably well separated in time from transits. And the ones that aren't, we can get around by just being really careful with the targets we choose. Now, what do I mean by that is that different stars do different things. Not every star shows all of those things, thank God. Uh, what this is, is a figure uh, from a paper I wrote a few years ago showing the noise properties of stars. So this is temperature here going up. This is a log G going down because astronomers are stupid. Um, but this is basically like the HR diagram. Uh, and the color of the points is the noise. So blue is less noisy and red is more noisy. Um, so this is using the original Kick Kepler input catalog. So some of these weirdnesses out here and up here are just misclassifications which have sorted themselves out. But essentially the point is that this box in here these are the main sequence dwarfs that we, are, that we care about. One of the reasons we care about them is because they're well behaved on transit time scales. So these are the giants and subgiants up here. I've kind of sized the font by the impact of the different stellar noise on the light curve. These are the FGK dwarfs down here. So you, get, you do get some of this stuff, but luckily it's mostly the sort of thing you can integrate over. And these down here, you know, you've, you've gotten up noisy again because these are the M dwarfs, and those are the more active ones. They've got spots and flares and are generally a pain. Uh, so that's one of the reasons why we wanted to look at sun-like stars. Our sun, pretty quiet. We thought, we'll go out, look at 200,000 of those, we'll be fine. Uh, it turns out we were wrong. Um, here's just another way of visualizing that. So this is the same kind of plot as I showed before, where this is magnitude and this is noise. This is now just a heat map where the color shows you how many stars ended up there. And the point here is to show that there's this population up here, which actually gets well separated out if you plot them just for stars with log G greater than 4 and just for stars with log G less than 4. So this whole population up here of noisy things is the giant stars. Uh, there's, not a lot of, there's not a lot of points here because we tried not to have giant stars uh, for many reasons, and one of them is because they're more noisy. So how did we go? We were aiming for 10 parts per million in our stellar error budget. Uh, it turns out stars are noisier than the sun. Even solar-like main sequence FGK stars, on average, are noisier than the sun. We had hoped that the sun was noisier on average than stars, but we were wrong. The stars are on average noisier than the sun. So this point here is the sun averaged over the 11-year magnetic cycle. This is a plot from Ron Gillan's paper. Uh, this is basically a histogram of the, of the noise in the stars. So most of the stars actually are between 10 and 20 parts per million noise. Uh, and this is integrated over that six hours. And then you have this long tail of noisy things. 
But the point is, we were aiming for this, and most stars are more noisy than that, which is a bummer. <coughs> but stars aren't the only thing that contribute. Telescopes do stuff too. OK, so this is fantastic. Here I am saying that Kepler doesn't have intrapixel pointing variations, and Jason just showed you that I'm wrong. <laughs> I love it. That's the first time I've seen that. That's very cool. Here, look at me like exclamation mark and everything. I'm, I'm so confident. Uh, the science. Um, so intrapixel var uh, variations. What this means is within a pixel, where the light actually hits, where that photon comes down and hits, uh, will create a different a number of electrons, depending on where it hits. There's an efficiency change across the pixel. So this is Spitzer. This is the sweet spot of a Spitzer pixel, where this is a really well-known effect, that there's these intrapixel variations. So this is uh, pixels in X and Y, and they've mapped out the gain here. And this is, uh, this is the most efficient spot. And also, it's kind of flat is nice. It doesn't change a lot in that part. So Spitzer, because of this uh, battery heater cycle, has these thermal changes that happen, which means that there's this, basically the sawtooth pattern in the pointing. Spitzer doesn't just sit still, it just goes back and forth and back and forth, with a bit of a drift as well. And the way that manifests in the light curve is as this sawtooth pattern. So these are the two shorter wavelengths of Spitzer, 3.6 and 4.5, that are still operating in the warm. And those are the channels where you see this, you saw, see this sawtooth effect. Um, if you look really carefully, you can see that this middle section here is below the line. So the line is a fit to the pixel position, and then this is actually a secondary eclipse of this target uh, below the line. So as Jason said, you know, ideally you move towards to fitting these simultaneously. You fit the position and the secondary eclipse at the same time so that you're not you know, introducing some bias in your depth by having it be in the fit. Uh, so this is a really well-known thing with Spitzer. It has also become a really well-known thing with K2. So the reason I said not Kepler to start with was if you looked at the scale on Jason's plot just before, the total range and change of the centroids was five thousandths of a pixel. That's how stable the Kepler pointing is. So the, the reason why this hasn't you know, become the tall tent pole in the noise calculations in Kepler is that the pointing was incredibly stable. In K2, however, the pointing, they've set up this amazing ingenious system with K2, but it does have this issue where the spacecraft now rolls, and then six hours later they tweak it, and then it rolls, and six hours later they tweak it, and it rolls. So what you get is this effect in the data where you're mapping out these intrapixel variations again. Uh, so this is a, a light curve from Andrew Vandenberg. This is before you've corrected it for position, and this is where you've like decorrelated against position, essentially. And you can start to see, you can see this rotation curve come out, and you can see all these little baby transits. So you've got to dig past this noise to get down. So in ter-pixel variations, this is basically your flat fielding, the fact from pixel to pixel, they have overall offsets in efficiency, let alone within the pixel. Uh, most of the time, your pointing is hopefully okay that that's not a problem. Occasionally, like me, you get to work on a project where that's not the case. Um, so when I first mo moved to America, I worked on the epoxy uh, epoch mission. Um, and this is, this is position again, but this is not like fractions of a pixel. This is tens of pixels. Um, so this is the spacecraft starts, let's say, here. Uh, the target wanders out of the field of view for a while. A few hours later, it comes back in. It wanders all around the CCD. It wanders out again. So you can see if you don't have an excellent flat field where you understand perfectly how every pixel maps to every other pixel, you end up in trouble. So this is the light curve of that target before you've done any of this correction. And you can just see all of these variations is due to the fact that you're just marching from pixel to pixel and you haven't been able to fully characterize that. Luckily, you can build a map if you have enough information of which pixels respond in which way and, and correct that out. And this ultimately turned into one of the, one of the more commonly Spitzer used Spitzer methods as well. Uh, so then you get this nice flat light curve here. Uh, okay, so, so Kepler didn't have a lot of issues with the pointing and the pixels, but what Kepler really had an issue with was thermal variations. So Kepler, I mean, it was a $600 million thermometer in space. We can tell to within like a hundredth of a degree what the temperature of this satellite is because it changes the photometry. JWST will be an $8 billion thermometer in space, so we better understand the temperatures really well. So this is one quarter of Kepler data, so 90 days. Kepler observed in 90-day chunks. Um, this is a quiet, well-behaved star. Almost everything you can see here is systematics, is noise from the instrument and the spacecraft that we need to correct. I want to point your attention to the, at the start of each chunk of data, there's this hook. There's this thermal hook where every 30 days, the spacecraft has to turn around, download all the data to Earth, and then turn back and keep observing. 
and that has changed the amount of sun that's lying on various parts of the spacecraft. So it takes a few days for the spacecraft to cool back down again. Uh, and that changes all of these things. And the reason it changes all of these things is because the way we do the photometry is with whole numbers of pixels. We just add up like eight pixels, that's it. So if your focus is changing, if the focal length of your telescope is changing, uh, then the amount of light that falls into those eight pixels is changing as a function of focus. So as the temperature changes, your photometry changes. Uh, on top of these little hooks, there's also this larger scale thing that you can see. And that's due to the seasonal change of Kepler going around the sun. Uh, so this is two years worth of Kepler data now. And what I'm showing is the, the width of the PSF as a function of time for the two years. And originally we called this the mouse plot. And then when there were two, now it's just the focal length plot's much less interesting. But basically you can see that at certain times of the year when the spacecraft is, is, is hottest, looking at that part of the sky, when the when sun is falling on a specific part of the spacecraft, the focal width is largest or has the largest spread really. And then sometimes it's quite tight. Um, so these are actually the, the two different thermometers on board the spacecraft showing you what the temperature is at a given point. So you can see how well the temperature maps to the PSF width. So you need to be able to correct for these things because they introduce this large scale noise. Luckily, most of the large scale noise is introduced to multiple stars and then you can start to be clever about how you correct for them because you can see it in, across multiple stars. So this is a digression out of Kepler because Kepler didn't have an atmosphere to deal with, but we should talk about it because we don't all get to use Kepler. Atmospheres do stuff too. Basically, they ch it changes transparency. It's a really annoying extra optical layer above you that's just you know, changing with time. Um, so a lot of the issues we had to deal with was the fact that the air mass changes. You know, the stars rise, they go overhead, they set, and that's different thicknesses of star sky that you're looking through. It's color dependent differences in stars. So red stars do different things to blue stars depending on how much atmosphere they go through. Um, this is another page from my thesis talking about systematics. And this is a sort of classic thing where you're like, look how much is happening in that light curve. It's all to do with the atmosphere. This is basically just like sidereal time every Every day this is happening like an hour earlier, and it's basically as the star's going overhead, you get the same systematics happen every night. The humidity, if you care about M-dwarfs especially, the humidity is a big deal. Um, the amount of water in the air above you actually absorbs light. It absorbs this prefer preferentially red light, so you get less flux on nights when it's more humid. Um, so this is a plot from the MIRTH survey showing as a function of relative humidity, the average flux over a bunch of stars. So you can see as the humidity goes up, the average flux goes down. So this is another thing you need to correct for when you're trying to you know, back out your transit signal because this is, you know, this is a percent. So that's bad. That's the bigger than the transit. Uh, the variable sky background, so everything else is changing as well. So this you might have seen when I had this up before. This looks kind of cool. That's the full moon setting. That's what happened there. Um, and then the sky background just didn't get subtracted well enough. So these are the sorts of things you have to deal with when you're in the atmosphere. Um, Kepler didn't escape entirely from this. So this was something really unexpected that wasn't in our original noise budget. Speaking of variable sky background, this is a, a frame, a full frame image from Kepler. So this is all of those 42 CCDs. Um, and this is the sky background mapped out across blank pieces of sky across the whole field of view. This is what we call an Arga brightening, named after Vic Argabright, uh, who was the engineer at Ball who first identified them. What we think it is, is when the, sh when the shutter cover went off after the spacecraft was launched, tiny little bits of metal and meteorites and like little bits of dust basically were left floating in front of the spacecraft as the spacecraft orbits. And, and they're reflective because it's little tiny, tiny bits of metal. And sometimes they reflect light into the spacecraft across a big swathe like this. And it usually only affects like a minute or two worth of data. But you do see these like crazy sky background things happening. So this was not something we budgeted for. Luckily, it doesn't happen all the time. But uh, it was a real mystery <laughs> for a while, what was happening. Uh, so the other thing, if you've observed from the ground that you know changes, is the seeing. Um, and this is basically, if you have a point source in the sky, how much that point source is spread out by the atmosphere and all of the things happening in the atmosphere. Uh, and I won't go too much into it because basically it's the same thing as thermal changes in the sense it changes the amount of light that falls at a given point on your detector. Uh, so all of the same things that happen in terms of your, terms of your photometry. Uh, all of these things, you know, observing transits from the ground is hard because, you know, you get eight to ten hours of night every night and transits are four to six to eight hours depending on what you're looking at. These are all well-matched timescales. They're hard to get out. 
And this is why for a long time, for you know, the, almost the entire decade of the 2000s, transits from the ground were super hard and took a long time to take off. I was a grad student then, I know how hard it was. Um, so these were really hard to get around. That's why you go to space. Um, but luckily, as I said before, the good thing about them is typically they happen to all the stars. All the stars have an air mass change, all the stars have a humidity change, that kind of thing. There's some tricks because as I said, some of the stars get affected differently by the different things. But you can start to apply methods like principal component analysis or singular value de de decomposition and try and take out those common mode things and just leave behind what's unique to each star. Okay, detectors do stuff. How am I going for time? Fantastic. Detectors do stuff. Um, this is all taken out of the Kepler Instrument Handbook, which if you want to know more about instruments and detect detectors, go read this. It's a, it's a tome. Doug Caldwell and Jeff Van Cleef put a lot of work into it. Um, so I actually just cheated, actually, and I just pulled the contents page out so that I could just list for you the things that happen in detectors. Um, these are all of the things that happen to detectors. Uh, I don't need to go, I don't think I need to go through them all one by one because in general what they do is add to that shot noise limit at the, that noise floor that I talked about. They're all kind of Poisson noise uh, generated things. Um, so I won't go into too much detail. But these are all the sorts of noise that happen on a Poisson level with the detector. But there is another kind of noise that happens with the detector that I will go into slightly more detail. And this is electronic artifacts that we discovered in the data. And this was another thing that wasn't really in the original noise budget because we just hadn't appreciated what kind of effect this could have. So we call these image artifacts. Um, and typically what they are is that when the electronics are reading out the data, they hear each other. This electronics on this CD, here's that electronics on that CD, here's the electronics over on the fine guidance sensor, here's the electronics actually moving the data around down here. They all actually interfere with each other on quite a small level, but enough if you're doing you know, 20 parts per million photometry that you see it. Uh, and, they, and they interfere with each other. And you can see this actually when you read them out in, in what you see. So this is an example of one of these types of noise. So this is a moiré pattern. Um, this is three different sections of a CCD. And this is basically just supposed to be noise. Um, these black bars here, are the interference with the fine guidance sensors. So the fine guidance sensors are reading out much faster than the, than the observations of the stars because they're trying to keep the telescope pointed. Um, so you see, you kind of get that alias into the data that you read out. But the Moiré pattern is this more subtle change from light to dark. Um, and the problem with this is it's not static. If it just looked like that and stayed like that, fine. You know, we're doing relative photometry, that's okay. But the problem is, this is temperature dependent. Again, there's so many things that depend on temperature. The amount that the electronics noise hear each other depends on the temperature of the local, detect local detector electronics. There's a little bus down here, which has a thermometer, changes things. Um, so the problem is these little white and black bars are going back and forth and back and forth. And if you look at this, is, this is like a few pixels. So remember the star I showed earlier? If you have like eight pixels, that's like exactly the size of one of these valleys. So if it's going back and forth, you're introducing signals to your data that are just like transits. Um, the reason that is another problem is that not all the CCDs experience this exactly the same way. Some of them are much, much noisier than others just as a function of where they are relative to all the other CDs, other CCDs. So 17.2 is a bad one, 19.2 uh, is a bad one, 13.2 is a bad one. So there's some bad ones and they get much noisier than the rest of the channels. The reason that is a problem is because of the way Kepler observes. Kepler doesn't just put these 42 CCDs on the sky for four years. Every three months it rotates. So one patch of stars will be here for three months, then it'll be here, then it'll be here, then it'll be here, then it'll come back here to this noisy CCD. So what you end up with is once a year, much noisier data. And it's a correlated noise. Now, can you imagine if you're looking for year-long transits and you suddenly have year-long noise in your data, what that does? So here's an example of a light curve. And you can see every fourth quarter, stuff gets really noisy. And it gets really noisy in this correlated way, this red noise way, because of these artifacts. Uh, so if you're trying to do some kind of periodic search and you go through and try to match up three things and suddenly you have four quarters worth of correlated noise, turns out it's quite easy to find three things that you put on each other and look like a transit. 
And the problem is this happens to a lot of stars. Suddenly this is happening all over the, any, any group of stars that comes into these noisy CCDs has this effect. Great. Um, so the other thing that introduces is the, is the impact of like say one single bad outlier. If you have one single bad outlier, then you can find two bits of noise to fold that onto and suddenly you have a signal, okay? So it doesn't just, you don't just fold noise together, you can fold something else onto the noise. You basically mess a whole bunch of stuff up. Now the reason I'm harping on this is because noise doesn't just affect your, your understanding of a given transit. At this point, we're it's changing our understanding of populations of objects, of transits, because this is what it looks like. These are all of the tr tr threshold crossing events, TCEs, that came out of the Kepler pipeline in the first three years of data as a function of period. Uh, so it's a histogram, it's a function of period. Uh, short period, uh, 100 days, uh, 200 days, no, 300 days, here. This is 372 days, which is the orbital period of Kepler. So that's bad, because what we wanted to do was to find Earth-like planets around sun-like stars, and what we did was find a whole bunch of noise at the same period. Um, and then if you added an extra year of data, all you did was give a longer lever arm for that noise to find more things. So instead of having a single peak, now you have a broad peak that's about as wide, it's like nine, 90 days wide, it's about as wide as a quarter. So this is where we are now with the Kepler data. We're trying to solve, solve this problem currently with the last catalog that we're producing. How do we work out of this massive overwhelming amount of false positives, or false alarms, sorry Jason, uh, what of these are the real things? How many real things are there, if any? Uh, so this is the current challenge, uh, and that's kind of where we're stuck. Um, but that's a, just a particular example of how a noise that you didn't, a noise source that you weren't really expecting, really, really messed up your answer. So how did we do in the end? So our budget, remember, was 20 parts per million. Um, these were, this is the original breakdown. So we ended up nearly 50% above that. Uh, if you take into account all these extra sources of noise, uh, we ended up closer to 30 parts per million. What that meant for Kepler was that in order to achieve the original mission goal of Earth-like planets around sun-like stars, instead of three and a half years of data, which is what we originally had, we actually needed seven years of data. So we had just gone back to headquarters with this pretty ironclad argument, we need seven years of data, and the second reaction wheel broke. So we didn't get seven years of data, we got four years of data, and we're doing what we can with the data that we have, but Slowly, I would say the project is kind of iterating towards the potential answer that we might not actually be able to measure this number. Uh, we might have to redefine our parameter space that we measure this number, um, which is a bummer, but we're trying hard. Um, so to come back to this figure one more time, uh, all of those reasons that I just spoke about for the last 40 minutes is why we have not gotten to 20 parts per million. This is the 10th percentile, this is the median, uh, this is the sorry, the, the median of the dwarfs, and this is the median of all stars at 12th magnitude. And what we were aiming for was like here to be the median. So we missed, we missed. But we did better than any other mission that had ever done before. We got the most spectacular photometry that anybody had ever seen. Just wasn't quite enough. Uh, so I'll just end by saying there's a lot standing between you and your nice clean transit. Uh, just imagine your line of gladiators ready to go. Uh, you can make clever choices when you're doing this, though, about the targets that you look at, about the time scales that you're looking at, about the stability of your instrument. I'm sure Xavier spoke this morning about Harps North and the way they keep that stable vacuum and temperature and everything. Uh, if you can't beat them, join them. If you have lots and lots of systematics and it happens the same across all stars, you can, get, you can take them out to some extent. Um, and then at that point, this is when you go to your statistical colleagues and you say, OK, now I have noise. Help me deal with it, which is hopefully what the rest of this workshop is about. Thanks very much. <laughs> we would have probably in more like four years, because there was still this extra source of noise with the... Um, I'm sorry, Jessica, can you... Oh, I'm sorry. The question is, if, if stars hadn't been more noisy, uh, would we have gotten our goal? Uh, we would have gotten much closer. You can see a lot of the extra amount is because stars were twice as noisy as we expected. Um, but there was actually, we have this additional source of noise, which is this image artifact noise. Uh, we got pretty close with the detector. Um, and then a slight, slightly bit more noise from the rest of the Poisson contributors, like read noise and stuff. 
No, I'm, I, I'm pretty sure that's just where his fit failed. Don't worry about this. The, the next level up reaction wheels. <laughs> the question was, what would we have changed 10 years ago? And I said, kind of glibly, the reaction wheels. Um, or three more years, or, you know, you can get around the stellar noise a little bit with a bigger telescope. You know, it's all budget. It's all budget stuff. A lot of this stuff isn't surmountable, but it's, it's, you, it's what resources you have to push on it. You, that's where you have to make your trades. You have $600 million, how are you going to build your telescope to get this answer? So, it's where you put your money. Uh, right, yes. So, so, a lot of these are also, when you guys are doing your hands-on session for transit spectroscopy, a lot of these are also sources of noise in there. I've, all of the things I talked about were broadband sources of noise, essentially. So, there's a whole extra class of noise sources for transit spectroscopy that I didn't talk about. One of which, for instance, is the limb darkening changing as a function of wavelength. Anything that changes as a function of wavelength, I didn't really address. Um, but a, a lot of these are contributors as well, yes. So Hubble has its, all, its, all, its whole own class of systematics that I didn't talk about. So it was something to, yeah. Oh, sorry, the question is, where did seven come from? You'd need to ask John Jenkins specifically, but it was basically like, how do we get this back down to a three sigma, sigma detection on an Earth-sized planet for at least, I think we needed like five or six transits then. Um, so seven was the safe number to get that. Yeah, we were wrong. <laughs> Science. Well, thank you. Thank Thanks you. Again.